My name is Ben Nibu. The nearest town was Kroschenko, Zakopane, which was the ski city, which was beautiful over there. And this is where I was born. The population of the town with the surrounding area, maybe were 15, 20,000 people, that's all. Oh. The whole town had 300 Jewish family, and everybody knew everybody. The boys I grew up with, and we, we stuck together. I had an older sister, which was two years older than me. I had a brother who was eight years younger. I had a sister. She was, at the time, six years old when the boy broke out. And I had another sister when she was three years old. Well, my father was a veteran of the First World War and was an invalid. He had a uh, right shoulder torn at the battlefield. He was dealing with fruits, you know, associated with the uh, orchard. Wow. By the time I went to public school, which is a seven, I, I was reading and writing Polish and I was reading, I was way ahead of everybody. Because I associated with, with the, in the public schools with my Gentile friends, which is never any problems, never inkling that, uh, that I'm different than they are. Or, but we never had any problems. We had school starting at 8 o'clock. I had to go in the morning. Before the school, we had to go to the Haider say the prayers. When I was already in the fifth and the sixth grade, I was helping out uh, after school. I used to clean the bottles and, and help in, the, in that little factory. And I, I made some extra money. For, and most of the time, uh, I gave it to my father. They needed it. We were five kids. And I helped out uh, always. The only religion we had is the Orthodox. Every holiday was very important. Any Jewish uh, holiday, we, we had fun in it. I remember the day when, when we had a knock on the doors, a neighbor coming, it's, it's the Germans invaded. It was on September, first, the first. The first shots that they were fired, they came in through the border, which was Kroschenko, Shavnitsa, towards our little town here. And there was a panic in, in the city. And I was 14 years old there. We were right on the, on the highway, and anything coming had to come through this highway. This was in 1939. German police came in into the town. They demanded people to work, to clean whatever they had, and uh, to work for them. In 40, we had to register. I was already 15. They wanted to have the highway fixed. And I worked on the highway with other three or four friends of mine. We used to break up stones so they could spread out and fix holes and potholes and something. I worked there the whole 1940, up to the winter. The Gestapo moved in already from, which is, was the SS. They used to uh, look for the Jews in here. They looked to beat them up. They seen uh, the rabbi, uh, uh, which he still had a beard. Most of them shaved up the beard, so he used to pull his beard. And then they had an order out that every Jew who had to wear a band on his left arm, it was a yellow band with a star in it. And if they cut you without it here, they shot you right off. And he was restricted. You couldn't leave this little town. And in the winter, we had to clean up uh, the snow so uh, the trucks could go through. Mm -hmm. By the end of 1940, in December, they came with an order that all the town had to be evacuated. All you can, could take is your belongings, what you could carry on you. You have to be out and by not later than January of 41, it was. You had to be in another town, which was Novesont, and where we were relocated, took a wagon, and we moved the whole family. We lost whatever we had, and I had to work twice as hard because my father couldn't work, and I used to work in the fields to, uh, to help uh, uh, to get food for bread and for food in here. They give you a, re a ration card. You had to be registered to receive the card. I was registered there. Because of me, the whole family received for five. We had uh, five uh, kids and, and my mom and dad. On that spring of, of that, of 41, they, I was working in the field. All of a sudden, I've seen from three sides that there was a Jewish police. I was 16 years old already. There were buses waiting for us. and They took us to uh, the forced labor camp in the name of the town was Rozhnov. 
what we were doing is digging in the mountains holes for bunkers, in other words, for uh, shelters against the uh, bombings. Or, and I worked there, and that was 41. Did you quota and you behaved, you didn't give him no headache. They gave you a pass over the weekend for one day to go and you see your parents. I had only one chance once I went back and see my parents during that time. It must have been four weeks before they, they liquidated the, the town altogether. That's the last time I ever see my parents. The Gestapo came here with sticks like you whip horses. And I was selected and I was so slow going. And he, he whipped me and I had a scar like this over my eye. I couldn't look, but I didn't say nothing. We went back to that camp to this uh, forced labor camp in Rosnu. And they transported these people, which was Treblinka, which was actually gas chambers. But we thought they were going, being transported, resettled, they call them. They took from one little town to another town, to a bigger town. 41, it was already coming to the winter. Must have been about 300 boys. Young, all must have been from 16, 17, up to about 30. Two of my friends decided that to go we are going, running away. About a month later, that they were shot. So they decided to clear it up the camp. So they came in and uh, picked us up on trucks. And we didn't know where we were going. We thought they were going to shoot us. So they took us from that place to a, a, name, a town named Tarnov. That was a ghetto. It was 1942 already. We knew our problem is we were stigmatized. You're a Jew and you're, this is what's what's for, waiting for you. I asked this Junrod there, uh, I had an uncle in here, this, his name is Spira, Bernard Spira. Where he says, yeah, you missed him here. He was just transported uh, last week. They took people, these, they transported them somewhere to a gas chamber to make room for different people. There were two ghettos, A and B. A was an Arbeit's ghetto, in other words, if you worked somewhere, for the Germans, or you work in a factory where they assign you, you live in an A ghetto and you had cart ration, you had food, you had something. B ghetto were the civilians who were older people in here. Uh, there were people for prey. In other words, if a German wanted a target practice, that's where he went. He went to the B ghetto and he was a hero and he used to shoot, shoot them like this. They brought us to a B ghetto. Why well, he says, how do you get in into this? He was a cabinet maker. His name was Zis. So he says, nothing, you just get the next money in here and you stay in my line. What we did over there, the, again, they were confiscating furniture, handcrafted furniture. We're bringing him in into a place, they call it uh, this uh, uh, Kopernika School. There was a big place and they made a warehouse out of it. They used to come in Gestapo and pick furniture to ship to Germany. We took this took it apart and polished it and fixed it in here so it was immaculate. They made Judenfrei again, this town of ghetto, and liquidated that camp. They took these people on wagons, either some of them were shot over there, and some of them were taken to uh, Treblinka, which was a gas chamber. They took out all the tradespeople from this town, from this town of ghetto. They sent them to Plashov, to this concentration camp. This was changing, which a forced, forced labor camp to a concentration camp. That was 1942. The food in the camp, they were brutal. They were, were terrible. They had that stew they used to cook for pigs. They used to give us this. The next day, we were, were assigned to Schlerai. It was a mill shop working with wood. That concentration camp, used, we used to work uh, in one of the barracks, and that barracks overlooked a ravine. I see they're bringing people with buses. They were marching They were marching down into the gully. I could see from the window. I heard shots. were shooting them down right down in the gully. Then there was a group coming in from the camp covering them up. This is the first time I actually have seen what, what's happening. Just brutally murdering people for no reason. The carpenter shot. For no apparent reason, the, the chief of the Gestapo, who was in charge of the camp, that hung him after the war, by the way, he came over for no reason at all. He came to the stove in here, and the guy was an older man, and was uh, just warming him up a little bit water. He pulled out a pistol, shot him, and everybody was looking. And he started laughing, and he says, All right, all right. Everyone had to go back to work. And I was uh, 19, a whole 42. And in the spring of 43, they took the whole section, the carpenters, and I thought to myself, they're going to kill us here or not, and they put us on a railroad. 
crack. It was already dark. They opened up the, the doors and everyone aroused, aroused, aroused. We walked out. There was, was guard jamming assessment with dogs and we were lined up in here and the, the assessment came in. They looked each one off and he says, you go here, you go here. So out of this group, there were some older people here and people who had glasses, they put them on the left side in here. And we went to the right and I found out that was Birkenau. We were uh, put on trucks. We wound ourselves going through the gate. It says, Arbeit macht frei. It was Auschwitz. And then we came into a block I've seen on the block, it says block 18A. And they told us if you go and go out without permission, you'll be shot. We worked 10 hours. Okay. We were all constantly guarded. They lined us up on, on in front of the building like they did every day. The music started to play, and you marched out, out of the camp to your assigned job. You cut your step with the music beat so they could count it. We didn't know what the band was. Uh, we thought that was a welcome for us. I was assigned to making barrels. There was a guy over there, and he was an engineer here, and he figured it out how to make these barrels so it was precision, so they were not leaking, because if they were leaking, he got beat up, and in turn, he beat up anybody who was working on it here. So he showed me the trick how to figure out. We used to make barrels, and we used to make tables with doors and windows, and they used to ship this to the to the Eastern Front, to the Russian Front. He says, listen, you know that I'm Jewish. He says, to me, you're a person. He says, says, I know that my friend, his father, who was my next door neighbor, his name was August Franczyk. He's here, he says. He is the chief cook for the Gestapo. So he told me what blocks, he gave me food, he gave me meat that they didn't have, nobody had, he had everything. Every Sunday I came over there and he gave me. And I had some other uh, friends of my friends that, that, that were starving. I gave him my food. See, I had a number tattooed on it in my arm. My number was 174, 163. Mm -hmm. Every so often they used to have a selection in the camp. They used to pick up, pick up the number and they used to send them away to Birkenau. And there were the chimneys in the crematoriums were, and the gas chamber was in Birkenau. They were burning every day, people. The stench of the smoke and the smell, it was unbearable. And you knew what they doing. Everybody was just trying to survive you knew it's well when is my turn there's no tomorrow here yeah. so he watched for me and, and, uh, and once they picked my number and he caught it in auschwitz this was already 1944 you'd never seen anybody older anymore now and then you find a little fella here in the uniform so what they did is a gesture that for for their pleasure or something in here the germans let in a little fella i was brought up orthodox and this fellow this friend of mine is maury he was a son of a rabbi, and uh, I knew every, wherever holiday there was, like it was uh, Yom Kippur. We knew Yom Kippur. He didn't need. What could I do? Mm. You are in a conflict with yourself in here. Is, is there a God? Is this human possible? What goes on in here? By, uh, by mid-November of 44, they were closing up to Auschwitz. The only they gave you is, is a coat, and it was already winter, and they started walking out. Everybody was walking out in Rhine, in Rhine. I seen this Dr. Mengele staying at the gate. I knew him. We were working also in a hospital. He was in charge. He was staying at the gate in here and, and, and counting out. They marched us, and that was a dead march. And we started walking. It was in November, and there were not, no food provided for us anyway. And we walked for about uh, two weeks. You could see piles of people dead. Those who were falling behind, they were shot. We did walk into... Uh, a railroad track, they loaded us up uh, cattle uh, boxes on the railroad, and that's where we were standing. And each one had 80 people. Sure enough, we come over here, everybody roused, and they ma marched us from the railroad to the camp, which was Mauthausen. And then they give you not just water in here, and you were just starving. You have a thousand steps going up to the thing. They so they're walking them up the steps, back and forth, and, and beating them up. So they fell up, just dropped dead over there. There were three camps around Mauthausen. They had uh, Melk and they had Ebenze, and they had another camp, Lynn. That camp in Lynn, they had in the mountains, they had holes dug in here. They were supposed to store uh, art. So we were assigned to uh, uh, Camp Ebenze, and we walked uh, for a day and a half. That was in the Alps, in the, and it was winter. It was in January of 1945. People were dying just walking here. This was the worst camp uh, that I went through 
and this uh, fella he, <laughs> he couldn't take it here this is my you have our members for me he gave me his glasses he says you have to live to say to tell this story and he went to the wires. He was electrocuted. Yeah, I lost a friend. He had bothered me here, the glasses. I always had the glasses. And I says, I got it now. I got to stick this through here because I owe it to, to this guy there. And in May, I think it was May the 6th, uh, I would hear the first rumble of tanks going through the to the doors. And then I see his American flag. It was a 281st Engineers Combat Battalion. Well, naturally, we were enjoyed. And they brought in some food and they brought the medics. They gave us uh, examination and uh, I was 98 pounds. I couldn't walk. Didn't take long, maybe uh, two, three days, we got some shot. We had the unclousing. They took us in to uh, clean ourselves up. I knew that I had family in, in America. The only way I could do is to go first to repay for, for the liberation. So I looked for the 281. They were in Salzburg, and uh, there was a guy with the name of Colonel Sass. So I want to volunteer for you, whatever you wanted me to do, I'll do. Gave us uniforms, and we cleaned the oh. pots and pans. They fed us. This outfit went from Salzburg, from Austria to Munich, and they took me with them here. And they gave me lodging, and they were preparing me to uh, go to the States, and I had to speak English. The only way I can get to the United States is First of all, they have to find my, if I have family. And this colonel's ass calls the Red Cross and he gives them the date. In three days, they had a reply. There's an uncle here, he was in Cleveland, Ohio. In 1946, in March, 285, they were already on their way back home. In April that, uh, 1946, they took us to Bremen, Hafen. From there, we, I came into the United States, May 6th of 1946. I was 21 years old 21. when I came. I came to New York, they were waiting for me at the pier. New York was a, such a hustle and bustle, I didn't like it. Here, I had another uncle who was in Cleveland. I had cousins in here. What I tell you, it's the truth. He didn't even let me say. It hurt me. Interesting, could you show me what you have in art in here? I was curious. So we walk over into the art museum. When we walk, you see chimneys there, as high as you could see. All of a sudden, it hit me, and I started running in here. And I ran as fast as I could. She couldn't understand why. So in here we had discussion. See, when I told you the other day, uh, something like this, hey, it, that doesn't happen. It, it couldn't happen. Human beings don't do it to the other human being. A culture nation like uh, Germany is, uh, uh, you know, don't do that. I thought to myself, says, where were you here? You had all the freedom in the world. Did you peep? Did you say something? You didn't know? Can, can you reason, can you give me an answer here? That's what it bothers me all these years. My dream was to learn a trade, finishing high school. I went four years to, to trade school. I knew my trade. I went to schooling. I'm graduated from a trade school. The freedom that I felt, it was so joyful. I was proud that I was Jewish. And I got married when I was 24. What? I have two daughters. Uh, one is uh, Ellen Jacob. She's married, she has two children. And my other daughter is uh, Terry Nebel, Britsman, and she has two little daughters. And I have a son, Michael Nebel, who is an attorney. It's Wait. not an easy thing to go through. I, I didn't sleep many, many nights. It's in you. And if not that fellow here, that Maury in here, I would never come over here. I would never live through. Because, see, this is what he gave me his glasses. He says, you remember me here. You remember it so you can tell. That's oh. why I'm here. But each one of us, as an individual story, is that each his own things that he went through in here, and that these are these are true things. It happened, and those who say it never happened here, either they want to hide something for one for other reasons, or they don't know. And it happened. I had to tell the story. It was on my mind and my conscience. Nobody wanted to hear before. At least now I can say, well, it happened.